<laughs> okay, morning everyone. Um, again, sorry, sorry for that um, little technical um, difficulty there. I apologize for that. So I will I will start over um, quickly. So my name is Kishore Ragbir. I'm an acting plant pathologist. I'm in the Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries, and I'm based at the Research Division Plant Pathology Unit at Centennial. And with me, I have my agricultural officer, Mr. Raymond McCoon here. Um, we'll be looking at the chat. So um, I will proceed. So the topic today is frosty powder rot disease of cocoa. And I'll be discussing um, the following year. What is frosty powder rot disease in cocoa? Its distribution, its symptoms, the, li the life cycle of the disease, how it is transmitted, and management strategies. Right, so frostipal rot disease of cocoa is a disease caused by a fungus, Monilifter aurorii. So this disease is caused by this fungal pathogen and it affects the cocoa pods and beans and not the whole tree with the leaves and branches and roots. Right, so for the distribution of this disease, first off, I just want to say that it is not present in Trinidad and Tobago. And this was confirmed in a survey completed in 2020 between months of June to August. And the report was completed in September 2020. So this frosty rot is not present in Trinidad and Tobago. Right. The disease, however, is present in our neighbors, very close to us in Western Venezuela and other countries in South America, which are Ecuador, Colombia, and Peru. And in Central America, the countries there, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, Guatemala, Belize, Mexico, El Salvador, Panama, and Bolivia. And in 2016, it was reported in Jamaica in September of 2016. And Jamaica is one of our main trading partners in agricultural produce. So there is a threat of disease coming into Trinidad and Tobago. This slide shows the map of the distribution of the frosty powder rot in Central and South America and in the Caribbean. Right, so the little red dot just south of Cuba and east of Hispaniola is Jamaica there. Any little red dot? Right. So that is the that is the distribution map of Ephrastipod rot disease. Right, okay. So the symptoms of Ephrastipod rot. Okay, I know that there is a is a delay in the slides that I'll be um, showing and what you all will be seeing, but if you all be here with me, right? So, so you all can be here with me. Um, I'll be talking on the slide and then you, there'll be a delay reaction of uh, a couple of seconds or so before the slides come on, on on your screen. Right, so for the next couple of slides, I'll be talking about the symptoms of a frostipod rot disease. Right, so this slide shows a young cocoa pod or cola shell, and after infection of about four weeks, this will be what you will be seeing: gross gross distortion of the the tissues due to hypertrophy and hyperplasia, which is simply cell division and cell enlargement. So this is what persons will see one month, approximately one month after the fungus have infected the young pod. And the disease, there's a progression of the disease. So after about two months, six to eight weeks, that pod, you'll get irregular chocolate brown necrosis appearing in the swollen or distorted cocoa pod. Right, so as you will notice from the first slide, the disease will progress from the first week, from the fourth week, and then another 
six to eight weeks after, you will get this this um, symptoms with the with the chocolate brown necrosis, and then another two to three months after the infection. So we are all referring to the first infection. So this pod is about four to five months old, but after two to three months of the infection, you will be getting this white pseudostroma developing on the dark brown necrotic region, right, of the pod, and this. White pseudostroma is simply the mycelium of the fungus growing. And this is where the disease gets its name from. This frosty appearance of the cocopod, which is the mycelium really of the fungus. So the disease got its name frosty pod rot from the from this from this pseudostroma um, coloration, the frostiness or the frosty appearance of the mycelium of the fungus. And then another couple of weeks after, you will get the brown pottery spores developing. So the progression of your disease from the mycelial stage to the spores production, you will get this slide coming up, which you will see shortly, right? So you'll get this slide coming up where the spores now, after a couple of weeks from the mycelium, the spores will be developed. So you'll get the dispersion at this stage now. So this brown pottery spores will be developing. On the, on the pod. And this is infection like approximately two to three months after infection of the pod. Right, so the next slide, which you will see shortly, will be the internal symptoms of the cocoa pod. So it will come on your screen in a little while. So you'll, right, so you'll see now here a mass mucilaginous. Um, in, in, inside, inside the pod. This is the internal symptoms, whereas the external symptoms, all you might see is just an irregular ripening. So sometimes you might not be able to tell by just looking at the cocoa pod externally because all you might see is irregular ripening and you might think that that is probably a small problem. But inside the, the bean, inside the pod, the, it's totally um, uneconomical. It cannot, it cannot be used again. You'll get this compact mucilation as bean mass, and all this is caused by the fungus. Right, so this other slide that I'm showing here, which you all, which you all will see in, in, in a couple of seconds, it's just a cluster of um, pods at the base of a cocoa tree. And at, at, at this stage, you will see, you will see premature ripening, you will see pods with premature ripening, you will see pods with with um, total necrosis, you'll see pods with the pseudostroma. So at this stage, at this, at this, at this um, slide, there will be different stages of the, the fungus on on um, on pods. So it's a good picture where you see in shell stage distortion. You see the second stage where the, the chocolate brown necrosis, and then the white pseudostroma, and then total necrosis. So this was a very good slide I wanted to show where on one tree, you will see all the stages and symptoms of the Fossipod disease. And this other slide is just an end stage where you will see mummification or total destruction of the pod. So these pictures were given to me from right. So you'll see it here now, right? So this is an end stage. But persons could could mistake this mummification with black pod disease as well. So black pod disease have similar symptoms at the end stage where it could get mummification. So mummification could be due to frosty pod rot and black pod disease. Right. So this next slide here now is symptoms of the frosty pod rot both external and internal and a comparison. So you'll see this coming up on your screen just now, right? So if you look at the top left and the top right, the top left and the top right uh, is a healthy pod where the external symptoms, there's no symptoms in the top left and the internal symptoms, there's no blackening of the bean. So that is a that is a very healthy cocoa pod. But from the second picture on the left 
and on the right with the external symptoms and the internal symptoms, you'll start seeing the deformation of the, the pod. And then on the internal symptoms, second on the right, you'll start seeing the fungus getting the, the internal tissues and the beans black. And from the third picture in, 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 in the left, you'll see the, the irregular discoloration. And then on the right, which is the internal symptoms, it is the beans are totally um, gone, meaning totally um, uneconomical. Like it, can't, it can't be used for anything else. So in this frosty pot rot, as very quickly, the fungus will be attacking the, the beans and the and the, um, the internal parts of the of the pod, and therefore it will, you you will not be able to get any any um, harvest from or any economical parts from from this cocoa pod, and then the lower pictures will be just be later down symptoms later down with the brown lesions, the proliferation and the mummification. Right, so this other slide here is just a culture plate that you'll see just now where the frosty pod rot um, fungus was incubated right in potato de dextrose agar so there are different agars water agar nutrient agar um, pda so um, this fungus was incubated um, and this is what came out in the in the potato dextrose four weeks after incubation and you would notice that the the pattern of growth of the fungus is a circular pattern and this is symptomatic of the frosty pod rot disease the the emroriri where you will get this circular pattern so this is a symptomatic um, growth of the fungus in pda and for confirmation you will have to do um, dna and pcr dna extraction and pcr analysis where you will have to get primers and do PCR amplification and so forth at our lab, at um, the biotech lab, where we are currently working on getting the proper reagents and the primers. But in the meantime, where the surveys are being done and, and suspected samples are brought in, um, the, if, if, if PCR needs to be done, the samples are shipped away to University of Florida and CAPI in the UK, in their labs for um, confirm PCR diagnosis. Right, so the next slide is just, I just want to talk briefly about the life cycle of the frosty pod rot fungus. So you'll see that coming up now. Right, so the life cycle will start when the spores germinate um, in, in a water film on the cocoa pod and penetrate directly, so that in, in, in a healthy pod. So this is the beginning of the, the, the whole life cycle. And the duration of the life cycle will, depends on, will depend on two things. The, the variety of the cocoa and the environmental conditions. So if you're in a climatic condition, which is um, moist and warm, the life cycle would be shorter. If it's a cooler conditions, uh, the climate is a cooler climate and then the life cycle will be longer. Right, so in this next slide, I just wanted to talk about the life cycle. So it will be coming up now. Right, so if we start at one, right? You can see it there, we're starting at one with the healthy pods to the bottom left of your screen. So we have three healthy pods there. So these young fruits now are are uh, infected or infested with the spore, the FPR of spore. So it, 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 it goes into the pod, it germinates, goes into the pod. So 30 days after, from one to two, you'll start seeing the symptoms like what I discussed before, the hypertrophy and hyperplasia taking place, which is just the distortions because of cell enlargement and cell division. So the distortions start occurring at two. So this will be approximately one month after infection. And then from two to three, we'll take another six to eight weeks from infection, which is about 20 to 50 days later. So three is 20 to 30 days later from two. So you'll start seeing the chocolate brown appearance. And then from three to four, 
will be eight to 12 days. So from when you get into four, it will be eight to 12 days from three. You'll start seeing the, the mycelial growth, which is the white, um, the, 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 the white part there, which is the pseudostroma developing. So this at four, this will occur about two to three months after infection, which I had discussed earlier in the earlier slides. So if you look at the whole cycle, it takes around 85 days. And then at four, you will start getting the spores developing and uh, with, with, with the brown spores developing. And then the spores now could last up to seven months and can be dispersed by wind, rain or animals. And then from four, it will start going, which will be stage five really in this diagram to start reinfecting now young, healthy um, buds. So this whole life cycle from one to five will take approximately 85 days to complete. So you're starting with spores and then in our backward spores. Right, so the next slide will be transmission now, which will come up just now. So I'm just waiting a few seconds there for the slide to come up. Right. So transmission of the frostbite rot disease. Well, transmission is, is 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 due to the release of the spores from the is the 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 pseudostroma. So infected pods, right, often left or caught on the ground, can release these spores from the pseudostroma. So the infected spores is a main source of inoculum for spread and transmission of this disease. So that is why later on in management, I spoke about moving out the, the pods, the infected pods from the field. So there's also natural transmission where the spores are transported by the rain, splashing rain, water currents, wind, ants, animals, other animals, etc., moving through the estate and moving through the field. So that is natural transmission. Then there's direct contact. So this, the disease could be spread by direct contact from a disease um, pod, cocoa pod, it's a healthy, the healthy pod, healthy fruits, right? So that is another source, and that can be happen on the same tree, of course. And then the major one is where the spores are carried by various um, mechanisms. For example, um, tools. The spores are transported by tools from one estate to the next, or within the same estate, from humans' clothes. Spores could stick on your clothes. And as mentioned before, the spores could last up to seven months in the diagram before with the life cycle. The spores could last up to seven to nine months. So clothes, vehicles, and humans are the main source of transmission from one country to the next, where persons could be, uh, say, in the visitor farm in Central America or South America, and they come back to countries that do not have this disease, like Trinidad and Tobago, for example. You travel and you do not wash your clothes, or you, or, or you have your or, or you have your your, your your shoes on, and you you probably just come back straight back into the plane on or boat and back to Trinidad or back to a country that don't have it. That is a main source of transmission. So so humans are key in 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 trying to prevent the spread of this disease. Right, so the next couple of slides now, I will be discussing um, disease management. So that will come on just in a couple of seconds. So there are about five points for disease management here. So regulatory control is one of the main ones for managing disease. Then there's cultural control, biological control, chemical control and breeding for tolerance. So I'll go through each of this each of these points, each of these five points quickly. So regulatory control, now, this is one of the main things in preventing the disease from coming into a country like Trinidad and Tobago, which do not have the disease yet. So each country would have a plant quarantine service, like Trinidad, there's a plant quarantine service. And in Trinidad, there are plant quarantine station based at all the ports of entry, all the designated ports of entry. So in Trinidad, there are three designated ports of entry, the Piaco International Airport, Port of Port of Spain, and the Pondlisas Port. And in Tobago, 
there is Scarborough Wolves and the A&R Robinson Airport. So those are the designated points of entry and they are planned quarantine um, offices there and planned quarantine officers stationed at these um, offices. And the planned quarantine officers are guided by the Plant Protection Act of 13 of Plant Protection Act 13 of 1975, which was amended in 2001. So this, so this, these laws would guide the officers on how to, to prevent the disease com, from coming in and what what they could do, what are their powers um, they could exercise in in agricultural officer agricultural produce coming into the country. And, and part of the law are like issuance of relevant documents such as import permits and all these are part, part of the, the, the Act, the Plant Protection Act. And the officers will be um, carrying out these, these, these things on the Act. Right, so, so the control um, continued here where you will see it just now coming up on your slide, um, on your screen. Trinidad and Tobago do not do not import cocoa pods and fresh beans. So, so the plant quarantine service would not issue permits for cocoa pods and fresh beans. No permits would be issued for for pods or fresh beans, and planted material are only bought through a third quarantine station where it would have, like right in, in, in the UK, where it would have to remain there and quarantine there for six, three to six months before it could come into countries like Trinidad. So that is a, that is a kind of mechanism, a protection mechanism there for planting material to come in. And we do import planting material like for research purposes, like the Cocoa Research Unit at um, La Reunion Station in Centennial and University of the West Indies, where the Cocoa Research Center is based. They, they will import um, different um, varieties and clones for research purposes. And the leaves are also bought in for fingerprinting, the, the cocoa leaves, um, and bought in for, for research. And these are bought in with special conditions on the permit. So, so therefore, each and everybody cannot bring in planting material and cannot bring in um, cocoa leaves and part because the cocoa industry is so protected that they have to get special condition, special, special permission and special conditions and permit for importing of these things. And of course, at, at this point, I'd like to say that um, because, because I have some background in plant quarantine, I would always deter people from bringing in cocoa or cocoa products or planting material or cocoa beans or pods <clears throat> illegally. Um, by hiding and bringing in stuff or, or trying to bring in cocoa beans through illegal ports um, just to make a few thousand dollars or something. I always say that in my presentations that it will cause millions of dollars of harm to the cocoa industry and to Trinidad and Tobago agriculture. If you try to bring in cocoa beans just for your personally, you want to gain a few thousand dollars by bringing in beans into Trinidad illegally. You know, so you have to look at the difference, the, 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 what, what, what could happen, you know, if the damages and, and the millions of dollars of harm could be done to the country. That's why you bring it just for a couple of thousand dollars. So the next slide here is that you will see on your screen in a minute, in a few seconds, is the cultural control now, which is basically the normal routine um, cultural control farmers would do in their cocoa estates where they would prune leaves, um, prune trees, sorry, uh, at an average height of about three meters for to control the amount of sunlight and shade and then shade regulation at the young stages of a cocoa plant. Um, you would want shade, but as the cocoa trees get older, you would want to cut, cut back on your shade and get more sunlight coming in. Um, cocoa trees will usually take a couple of years to bear, three to four years to bear pods. So an experienced cocoa farmer would know when it's time to prune his, his, um, his shade trees. And of course, cultural control will, will involve proper drainage, timely harvesting, recognizing the early symptoms of the disease, like what I discussed about the symptoms here, and complete removal 
of the fruits and removal of disease. But so, you, you, you do, as I was discussing earlier, you don't want to leave disease pods with that you harvest um, from your tree on the ground, on the bottom of a tree or in your, in your estate. You want to remove them because, as I said before, these pods, these disease pods will have, um, well, of course, we don't have the disease here in Trinidad, but I'm speaking of what 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 the practices would, 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 would involve if the disease do reach in Trinidad and what other countries in the world, like in Central and South America, do for their cultural control. Um, the countries and the farmers who, who do have the disease, they have to remove the pods totally out of their field and destroy it by burning or something. They cannot leave it there because it will be a source there for infection. Right, so the next slide there that you will see is chemical control, which will come up there in a couple of seconds. So I could go through to the meantime where um, the use of copper-based fungicides like cruppers oxide and organic protectants like chlorotaronil could be used on young pods. And, and um, of course, you have to treat the, uh, the main pod set, which is early to three months old, which is when the shower stage now comes up to three months old. And you must be, um, it must be in collaboration and complemented by frequent removal of disease pod. So it has to be working tandem where you're treating with chemicals and you're removing disease pods at the same time, together at the same time. And the third point there is always say um, that you have to use these, these chemicals, these, these copper-based fungicide, because it is expensive. So you want the use of the fungicide to be feasible, meaning expected to pay off. You can't pay, a farmer wouldn't pay thousands of dollars because usually these Coca estates are five to 10 to 20 acre blocks. So you would not use thousands of dollars in, in fungicide and you cannot get it back. It have to be feasible. So it have to be a high yield plantation with well-defined production peaks and make back your money in using fungicide. So generally we, we do not recommend um, fungicide for big large estates like that. Right, um, the next slide will be biosolar control, which we will see coming up. And, and biological control application of the antagonistic fungi or bacteria have shown to be effective in reducing incidence of FPR in field experiments. So countries have done it. Um, Costa Rica and Nicaragua and those countries um, have done field trials with, with Trichoderma and Bacillus, um, which is antagonistic fungi and bacteria, and have worked. So there are, there are um, avenues for biological control. Uh, the next slide is breeding, breeding programs, which will come up there now. So, so um, I'm just waiting for this slide to come up. The CATI breeding program is a program in Costa Rica, right? So it is up there now. A program in Costa Rica where a lot of breeding is done with the clones, right? So they have been breeding for disease tolerance for the frosty pod rot and other diseases. So you see multi resistance as the third point, meaning resistant to other diseases, black pod, which is broom, frosty pod. And of course, when you're doing a breeding program, you would want to do breeding for high yields as well and flying, fine flavored um, cocoa. So I was having a discussion because I just want to spend a, a minute on this slide. I was having a discussion with the other pathologist, Ms. Paris, Julia Paris. And she said, I could see, she said, I could see that our cocoa research unit at Centennial in La Reunion Station is doing a lot of work in breeding. And at present, we have the ICS 95 clone, which is Imperial College Selection, ICS Imperial College Selection 95, which is present in Trinidad, and it is present in the Cocoa Research Unit in both um, La Reunion Estate and at, at, at the, the UE um, Cocoa Research Center. And there's work going on on that, 
um, for Britain, although we don't have disease, the FVR in Trinidad, it was tested in Costa Rica and proven to be tolerant to the to the FVR disease. So, um, and and there are a lot of clones. There are a lot of clones um, that we have in Trinidad. Probably there's a field guide with about a hundred different clones um, with different morphology of the pods and things. So that and 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 I've been assured that a lot of work is going on in the in the Coco Research Unit at the Research Division in La Reunion Station there and at UWI. So I just wanted to say that on this slide. Right, so the next slide here now, I just want to talk about the survey that was conducted in 2020 and the results of the survey, just briefly, right? So the survey was conducted, as I mentioned before, in um, June to August 2020, and it was conducted in all eight counties in Trinidad. And in this survey, we did some surveys before in 2013, 2014, and 2015. We did surveys in 2016, 17, and now in 2020. So a lot of surveys went by before, but in this survey, we didn't get a chance to go to Trinidad anyone in 2020, in Tobago, sorry, because of the COVID thing. But um, Mr. Raymond McCool was instrumental in this survey in 2020. And it was done in all eight counties. And each county, 30 farms were surveyed. So 30 farms in eight counties, 240 farms. And each farm, 20 plants were surveyed and data were collected. So if you multiply 240 by 20 plants, you'll get over 4,000 plants. So, so the, the survey was a very comprehensive survey. And this was from a, a, a CAP international protocol um, that was um, given to us. And um, they, they, it was from a Jeff project as well. So it's a very scientific based survey and all, the, all eight agricultural counties in Trinidad were involved. And I have to say um, thanks to the director of the regions at this point, the agricultural, um, the, the regional administration, North and South, and their directors, and all their staff, the AOs and all their staff in the counties, assisted greatly. And without, with, with, without the officers from the different counties, the survey wouldn't have been a success. So I have acknowledgements later on, but I just wanted to say that now <laughs> in this slide. So um, they, were, they were very instrumental. So. Um, I just have one slide here again on on, on the presentation is a summarized um, version of the data because was a lot of data collected from the survey, right? So this is just a summary of the data. It's a whole big report. The 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 FPR survey and the FPR report is a big document um, that we do after the survey. So I don't want to talk too much on the whole survey. So this slide is just a summary of, of what happened. Now, the most outstanding thing here in, the, in this bar chart is the black pod disease, right? So the percentage disease present was 70%. Now, the slide, don't be misled by the slide. It does not mean, it does not mean 70% of, of, of um, all the three surveyed had black pod. Eh? It just means that out of the out of the four thousand trees, if if just a few hundred were diseased, seventy percent of that few hundred, right, Raymond? Seventy percent of that few hundred were black pod disease. Most of the trees surveyed were healthy, right? So don't be misled by the side by by thinking, okay, of all the trees surveyed in all the eight countries and all the thirty farms, seventy percent had black pod. No. The disease, the disease were this 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 bar chart just shows the percentages found on on whichever tree disease would whichever trees that were had the disease in most of our healthy. So again, the and another important part of this, which is probably the most important thing, is the second the second um, bar from the top, which is the frosty pod in red. You would notice it's a zero. So that is significant, where which means 
out of all eight counties and all 80 farm in each county, 240 farms surveyed, no tree had any symptoms of, of pods with frosty pod rot um, symptoms. Because the frosty pod rot symptoms is only pods, not only tree. So that is what I wanted to say about the whole survey. See, the whole survey is a real is a real in-depth survey and is from a is from a CABI protocol that we do the survey from. Right, so the next slide is just the future plan activities on the frosty pod rot disease. So the survey, the survey is done in Trinidad for all eight counties and there's another planned survey in November 2022 and or to January 2023 and in cocoa growing areas in Tobago. So hopefully this year we will go across to Tobago or the officers in Tobago will conduct the survey for us. So that is the future activity for that. And of course, in the cluster groups, there's continue, continuous awareness sessions where the farmers and other stakeholders um, are, are, are aware we do awareness sessions, we do presentations, and there's always flyers and posters and stickers where we would we would pass on and brochures we would pass on to the to the different stakeholders on the disease and to look out for the symptoms of the disease because as I said before we do not have it in Trinidad yet and there's always continuous surveillance activities that the officers from from the research division the crop protection subdivision the pathologists and the entomology staff as well um, when they're going out on their routine field visits, would look at um, would would look at um, cocoa trees and look to see whether there's any signs or symptoms suspected um, pods of the of the of the frosty pod rot disease on the pods. Right. So I basically come to an end to the presentation here. So I just want to acknowledge um, a few persons here now. The director of research. Ms. Beacom, the Deputy Director Research Crops, um, both present and, and former, um, especially Ms. Diane Ramrup, who guided me on this whole program, the, the staff of the Crop Protection um, Subdivision, Entomology staff, Pathology staff, and the Plant Quarantine staff, and any Pathology staff, especially the other two pathologists, Ms. Julia Paris and Ms. Mr. Terence Jack, and the two AOs, Karen Lacan, and um, my hardworking AO, Mr. Raymond McCoon, who is here with me. And of course, the support staff, Marissa, um, Sulan, Kizzy, yeah, um, Sharda, and Narin, Narin, who is a past OJT as well, who assisted in this presentation, in the slides and in the survey. Um, this, the staff of the Cocoa Research Unit at Larian Union Sentinel, the GF coordinator. Um, of course, the, the regional administration, North and South, their directors, the AOs in the counties and their hardworking staff um, in the regions who, who without them, the survey wouldn't be a success. And um, staff of ETIS for their publications and um, contributions and the CDC, the Cocoa Development um, Corporation for Trinidad Tobago Limited. Um, for their continued support and participation, and the Corporate Communication Unit, uh, Mr. Hines and Mr. Ramdas from the Ministry, and um, who set us up here <laughs> in this live um, Facebook stream. And of course, the organizations here, UE, USDA, AFIS, um, USDA, AFIS, ICA, FAO, CARI, and CAB International. And special thanks to Diana Ramrupa and K Maraj for the use of their photos. And the contact information for the plant pathology unit, um, the telephone number is 646-1645. Although we are having some issues now, um, we are trying to rectify the telephone now, telephone um, at the Sentinel Research Division and our email address. Um, you could always send um, all your, your, your email and pictures at pp Diag Laboratory at gov.tt. So thank you and uh, thank you all for your um, attention and participation. And we we are on the chat now, so I have Raymond here. So 
I will try to answer. I know I've gone on over the half an hour to 45 minutes, but because of some technical difficulties at the beginning, we we had started late. Um, so if any, I will try to go through some of the, um, the chat there and see if I could answer some of the questions here with Raymond here. And of course, we will we will look at each chat after the presentation and try to. We will spread the disease from Mr. Williams. We will see the same cocoa. Even, even if you see what I mean, we will use the same cocoa. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, Ms. Williams, yeah. If you use the same tools, the the the, the cocoa rod, you're talking about the, the cocoa knife, the tool to cut the to harvest the pod, right? Yeah. So that will have to be sanitized. Um, if if you're moving from one field to the next, the dispose dispose will be on the on the um on the tools used. So if your if your your estate is um is infested with the FPR and the spores, it will be trans transmitted with your with your cocoa knife and your harvesting tools from one estate to the next. So you'll have to sanitize it. I don't think this is in the hardware shop. Yeah, Clara Talanel, yeah, um, Ms. Ms. Williams, yes, the fungicides are available. Um, and I didn't go into comparisons of the disease with with um, blackboard disease and which is broom, but the the fungicide could be could be used um, for the other diseases in, in, in Trinidad. But as I said before, we do not have the Frosipod, the Moniolophthora aurora yet in Trinidad. So we do not have that fungus yet. So, but in general, um, the the blackboard and the which is bloom are fungal pathogens as well. So you could you could apply fungicide um, application and pesticides. Yes. You want to get some plants? Y yeah. Um, well, the, the the plants for the cocoa plants. Well, the Agricultural Services Division in St. Augustine Industries are the ministry's propag propag um, propagation station. The, the ASD will work in collaboration with the Cocoa Research Unit for production of plants. Now, plants could be from clones, which is the vegetative part where you can get the same genetic material from the parent plant. Those are the clones. So the, the propagation of the cocoa plants um, is a collaboration, collaborative effort between the ASD, the, the um, Agricultural Services Division, and the Cocoa Research Unit at, at um, La Reunion Research. So the plants, you'll have to inquire from them about the sale of plants and purchasing of them. Um, but I suppose you're speaking of the ICS-95, right? The, that clone, that, that, that um, FER tolerant clone, yeah. So, you can contact them and they and they will give you some further information on, on that, yes. Yeah. She does mention a lot of which room, but yeah. somebody wanted the other one. The fertilizer trees. The fertilizer trees, okay. So Miss Spencer, yeah, wanted to get some information on the fertilize, fertilizer for the trees. Yeah, well, the fertilizer program, you could use normal um, 121272 and with micronutrients at the beginning of the crop. And of course, we could, we could, always, we could always get back to you on that and, um, and answer some of the questions in the chat where the agronomy and the fertilizer regime and is concerned for for um, for cocoa for for cocoa trees. Yeah, yeah. So, so with that, I want to wrap up and thank everybody for for listening. I know I went over; it's it's close to one now. But as I said, uh, we had some difficulties, some technical issues at the beginning, and uh, by the time that was sorted out, that took up about fifteen minutes, fifteen to twenty minutes. So we started late. So I want to thank everybody for the attention and listening, and we will try to answer some of the questions um, on the chat um, during the course of the week. 
Så tack så mycket. Bye.